asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. You know I love his work. I've been speaking to him for many years since I uh, began making programs like this in Spain. He's a remarkable man. His work has appeared everywhere over the years. Every major newspaper and magazine publication he's contributed to. And he's contributed to thousands and thousands of television programmes and radio shows over the years. He's an impeccable journalist. You can read him every day at nomorefakenews.com or johnrappaport.wordpress.com. He puts um, very, very well-researched articles up there daily. I read it all the time, I do, and I tweet stuff out all the time from John. But in the last couple of days, he's been talking about things that have been coming up on this programme. 5G and the Internet of Things. Let's welcome back to the programme our friend John Rappaport. John, thanks for giving us your time today. It's valuable and I appreciate it. How are you? Very good, Richie. Good to be here, as always. Thanks for coming back. You know, spoke to a really interesting man on the programme in in, in the last uh, few days. A man who works in technology. And he's been talking about, John, how transmitters have started appearing on lamp posts in a northeastern town called Gateshead, which is very near Newcastle in the United Kingdom. We're talking thousands of these things. And what they are is 5G boosters. And he reckons, John, and I'm going to tweet out links to the interview I did with him and where people can find him, he reckons, does Mark, uh, Mark Steele is his name, he reckons that these have coincided with a deterioration in the health of people locally. You've been writing all about it. Brilliant article, by the way, 5G, harmful effects of a new technology. I wonder, John, these transmitters popping up on lampposts, is that, are we going to see more and more of that? And are we definitely going to see an immediate drop in the quality of health in communities? Yes and yes. Uh, We're going to see much more of that all over the world because uh, this is a global program and a global push for 5G. They're serious about this. They don't want to brook any opposition. So these cells, as they call them, which aid in the transmission of 5G uh, signals, uh, wireless transmissions, will be on lampposts, they'll be on buildings, they'll be on homes, they'll be in the streets, they'll be everywhere because as fast as the transmission is, unlike 4G, it can only travel short distances. So it has to be uh, picked up or boosted and carried along in an unconscionable number of these cells or uh, transmitters. And the health effects have been well documented in many, many studies. I could uh, point listeners to a website called emfscientist.org, which contains a letter and a petition from many scientists on this issue. Immune system, very serious problems, cancers. Uh, broken DNA, et cetera, et cetera, mutations, uh, among many other health problems, both what they call thermal and non-thermal. In other words, some resulting from the heating up of the body by the frequencies being used in 5G and then other uh, injuries that are not thermal. So whether or not we will be told about immediate uh, health consequences or whether people will be able to connect what's happening to their health to the installation of 5G, that's another question. But as I've documented over and over again for many years, what the medical cartel does is it takes dangerous and life-threatening effects from technology, from major corporations that pollute, from uh, toxic medicines, et cetera, et cetera. And it reconfigures these into fake 
disease labels. So this is their way of hiding those effects and so, so to speak, retranslating them so that people then end up going to doctors and doctors say, well, you have X disease or X disorder and so on and so forth, and we have to treat that. The person says, well, is it possible that this could have to do with the installation of 5G transmitters and so on? The doctors say, that's ridiculous. Couldn't possibly be connected to that, you know, uh, based on no knowledge, of course, just saying that. No, 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 you have a disease, you have a disorder, we know what it is and we have to treat it. That's the way all this is hidden. The gentleman I spoke with, Mark Steele, would endorse what you said. He's um, He heads up the research laboratory of a tech firm that's involved with motorsport safety, John, and helmets. And it's really cutting edge stuff and it involves computers and data and all sorts of stuff that's related to, to this. And he described these transmitters, he described them as a weapon. He said this is a weapon that they're putting on the streets of the UK. He said it can do several things. He described the heating capability that it has, the ability to affect the human body and the brain and to breach the blood-brain barrier. But he also said it'll 3D map houses uh, apartment complexes they'll be able to know as much as this is going to be detrimental to our health it's also going to be a surveillance total lockdown John it'll be able to tree, 3D map everything in a house from the outside and feed that data to uh, whomever and outside of course John Rappaport and no more fake news and a few other people we could mention there's very little talk about this on commercial media or in our newspapers. I think I saw one report. Now, you're quite right. There are reports. Academics have said, this is dangerous. We need to know more about it. We shouldn't just sign off on this. But by and large, John, the media are absent again, right? Absolutely. And uh, you're absolutely right about the 3D mapping because that's called the Internet of Things, meaning that all devices in your house and all, and all devices in uh, new housing developments will, if you, know, if you don't resist it, contain a connection to the internet. I'm talking about your toasters, your stoves, your refrigerators, your clocks. Whatever is electronic in your house will be connected to the internet which means not only will these devices be recording you and spying on you, but they will be able, and smart meters, of course, are connected to this, they will be able to measure down to a very fine point your use of energy, which is the bottom line as far as the technocracy is concerned and actually has been since the 1930s. They spoke about this in America in the 1930s, the ability to measure the use of energy down to the level of the individual for the planned society of the future, meaning that people up the line at some point would be given energy quotas. You can use so much energy in a given time period. And of course, this is now capable of being absolutely measured, which was not the case in the 1930s. This is the same plan. So that in your house, for example, major brownouts could occur where certain devices will not work or they'll only work at a very feeble level or in extreme cases, blackouts because you have exceeded your energy quota. And of course, they justify this and explain this by saying that climate change is threatening to fry the entire planet. And so we have to modulate, regulate, control and lower the total use of energy all over the planet. And this is their method of doing that, the so-called Internet of Things. Cars, of course, at some point in the future will be entirely driverless because cars are also connected. 
they will talk to each other. They will talk to a central distribution and control point so that you want to go to a certain place. Well, the car is going to take you there according to its own ever-changing plan to modulate all traffic flows, et cetera, et cetera. And then eventually there will be this. Cars are extinct. We don't need them. If all you're doing is sitting in a car and being taken somewhere, then everything must occur as public transport. Cars are out of the question. And so people will be herded into public transport from wherever they are, and cars will be an extinct species of the past. All of this is the technocratic plan for considering every human as an energy consuming unit that has to be monitored, spied on, regulated and controlled. Now you've written several articles about this, including one you posted today called Internet of Things Formula for a Global Trance. And I just saw that before coming on air. So this is multifaceted. So this technology can also induce in people a state of acquiescence to this, John. So we don't basically Absolutely. revolt against it. Absolutely, because the whole essence of this is, let's say your home is completely uh, regulated and controlled. In other words, all the devices operate as they will, not as you want them to, but they give you service just as a driverless car does. So what is the psychological effect of this over time? People become more and more passive. Why learn anything about anything? All you have to do is flip a switch in your house and your house operates on your behalf, so to speak. Of course, eventually there is no switch. You are on the grid and you can't get off. That's the plan. And so when people begin to accept this more and more, because the carrot is, isn't this wonderful? Your refrigerator knows exactly what's in it and will order new food when necessary. Your toaster will decide how brown the piece of bread should be. Wow. Your car will come to the front door when it's time for you to go to work, etc., etc. All of these things, your lawnmower, if you have a lawn, will simply mow the lawn when it's time. And people say, well, this is wonderful. This is exactly what I want. And that's the carrot, you see. Oh, this is just fabulous. But on the dark side, the stick is, if you resist, if you rebel, if you question, if you criticize, you are now implacably placed on the grid and they can cut you off. They can say, you are a disturbance you are a danger to the oncoming utopia that we are giving the world and therefore unfortunately we have to cut you off from energy wow like china we saw that in china didn't we recently people being cut off their access to their bank accounts being cut off and also i know it's a different type of thing but it's similar in terms of the punishment you're so mm -hmm. online you're so on grade john what you're describing there is human beings becoming obsolete? I was listening to a radio phone-in show about six or eight months ago, and it was a senior gentleman um, who, who rang up. And um, you don't often hear very, very senior. I mean, this man was in his, he said he was in his early 90s, and I think he was too. And he rang up this phone-in program, and he said he couldn't believe that his grandchildren or his great-grandchildren were asking Alexa for answers to things. So they were saying... Alexa, what's the square root of whatever? And, of mm -hmm. course, Alexa was telling them. And this very, you know, experienced gentleman, John, he saw where that was going to lead. And he said that pretty much. He said, well, won't we basically erase ourselves eventually through this technology? Yes, in a real sense, we will. Because consider the old-fashioned virtues, you know, ambition, achievement, willpower, the free will and choice to decide what future you want and you work for it, etc., etc. All of these things, self-reliance, self-sufficiency, these are all declared to be extinct by the technocracy. 
oh, no, 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 we have the technology now where we can just simply give you all of these things. They're just part and parcel of being born into this world. Isn't it wonderful? And so you will find as time goes by, gradually, in some cases suddenly, that people begin to say, well, you know, I've got everything I need. Yeah. All I have to do is talk to Alexa and ask questions and get answers. And, uh, you know, what's the next step? Well, I guess it's hooking my brain up to a supercomputer that downloads supposedly information into my mind, the very best information. And then where is being human at that point? It's gone away. It's gone. Can you imagine, you know, a scenario in the future where some central computer decides that somebody's usefulness has been used up and that person might be unwell, maybe not able to work in, you know, one of these factories. By the way, it was the social credit system in China that I was thinking about, which is really Orwellian. But can you imagine a situation in the future? The, the central computer system decides somebody's usefulness is gone and somebody says, hey, Alexa, I'm not feeling that well. Um, what, what shall I take? And Alexa says, well, why don't you mix a little bit of turpentine with a little bit of methylated spirits? And I know that might sound a bit childish and a bit silly, John, but it's, no, not, it it's, not, it's not beyond the bounds of possibility. And no, it isn't, because yeah. we're talking about, uh, you know, formulas and algorithms. And what are these based on? They're based on an overall view of utility, of energy usage, so central control has decided that in the northeast of uh, England, for example, by a survey of the population, that energy use is being provided to a number of people who really are not fully alive. They're on a, a steep decline in health and chances are good that within three or four years they'll die. And but the total energy consumption of the area itself is too high relative to the algorithms. Well, we have to eliminate certain people and that will put us back on track again. And it'll be a simple decision. And at first, of course, there'll be outrage and shock and this and that and the other thing. But people will be assured that the person, uh, you know, died pleasantly and at home and uh, suffering was eliminated that would have occurred otherwise and it's all for the greater good and because people are already so passive and accepting and uh, if you tell them, well, look, if we let these people live, we would have to subtract energy use from you and your devices. Well, then it's a fait accompli. Then people would say, well, we understand, you know, it's, it's kind of harsh, but uh, this is the new reality. And after a couple of more generations, nobody would even question it. And do you know why John Rappaport is right, dear listener? Do you know why he's right? Because we've had a number of cases in this country recently where babies have p parents of children who've got serious illnesses are being told that the state is making a decision to withdraw care from those children so that they will die, even though those children are comfortable and not in any pain, meaning that maybe at some stage in the near future something might change. We're seeing this. So if that's happening now on a human level, why would machines be any more moral than the things we're seeing now? John Rappaport is our guest. Um, it's great to have John back on. It's been a while since John was on. Um, johnrappaport.wordpress.com nomorefakenews.com I've already tweeted a link to these articles by the way, these are excellent articles it's a trilogy of articles in the last couple of days, along with thousands of other articles about important information, but th this particular issue John, I don't know if you're aware of this um, you have enough going on yourself, but nearly 2,000 what am I saying, I'm an idiot, nearly 20,000 healthy trees are being cut down in the steel city of Sheffield. I know Pittsburgh's the big steel city in the US, but Sheffield is the big steel city here. Nearly 20,000 healthy trees are being cut down, John, and there are protests against this. People have been contacting this radio programme. It's been covered even by the mainstream news. And a lot of people who get their information from sources like yours and programs like this, they believe these trees are being cut down for this 5G rollout, John. 
And they Why might be are they right. saying the trees are being cut down? Because they're, what, what they believe will be put in their place will be structures, lampposts or poles to, uh, to host these transmitters effectively. To boost what the, basically this. What are the uh, the so-called leaders and morons saying about why they're cutting them down? Well, you see, there's when, when they're interviewed on BBC programs and regional programs, they're being very vague about it. You know, when, when when they're being asked, for example, look, these trees are absolutely healthy. They're being very vague. They're giving a number of kind nonsensical reasons, and they're saying, well, we're going to plant saplings in the meantime. So they're given a lot of silly reasons, but really, um, people are suspecting because these trees are healthy, they're not sick, John. These are, you know, trees 50 years, 80 years, 100, 150 years old, you know, great trees. And people are saying, what are they? And it's a group called STAG in Sheffield, which is against this. And a lot of their activists have been arrested. It's a major story. But it's beginning to look like that it is being um, done to help enable 5G for the coverage of it. Quite a staggering are they, story. Are though. they cutting them down all in one place or is it everywhere, you know, on streets and so on and so forth? Everywhere, John. It's right across um, the, the inner city, Sheffield, right across the inner wow. city. Wow. Amazing. I know. I, I hadn't heard of that. That's horrendous. That is horrendous. I would think just off the top of my head, that yes, it could be 5G, but also it sounds like, you know, somebody wants to build some kind of new centers of something, you know, uh, technological in nature, perhaps, who knows what they are, if they're clearing that much land, I mean, 20,000 trees, that's a lot of land, that somebody has a plan in their pocket for, quote, the future where there's a tremendous amount of money involved and a few people are going to make that money uh, while everybody else suffers. Do you know what they're doing, John? Do you know the most common... They've given a number of excuses, um, access being one, but, but the most common excuse given is the trees are diseased. They're not diseased, John. Because I've seen tree surgeons and botanical, if you want to use that word, botanical experts say there's nothing wrong with these trees. And even the Daily Mail, which of course is the biggest uh, tabloid in the UK, the Daily Mail has even said, to be fair to the Daily Mail, it has acknowledged that some activists are saying that the trees are being knocked out of the way so that the signal won't be interrupted, the 5G signal, so that it'll be able to be all mm -hmm. pervasive across the city. So there's definitely something to it. Stag well, that's, uh, now that last point is very significant. Because the reason, or one of the reasons, I would say, not the reason, that they're putting in so many of these 5G cells or transmitters is not just that the signal needs to be boosted as it moves along, but because it can be blocked by buildings, trees, etc., etc., etc. So, yes, there could definitely be that connection. And imagine if that's true what will happen to other forests and other places where the authorities in, in connection with corporations decide, you know, there's just too much impedance here, too much blockage. We have to knock down whole areas in order to implement 5G and get it to consumers. So we are going to do that. In which case this area could be a test case to see how much protest is there going to be? How quickly or slowly are the people going to give in? What happens after the trees are all cut down? Et cetera, et cetera. Because always in these uh, test operations, they do what's called after reports, where they analyze the reaction, the public reaction, in very great detail. Okay, how did we do, boys? How did that work out? Give us the report. What do we have to learn so that we can be more successful the next time when we go somewhere else and do this? So that could definitely be part of the 5G program. Just to finish that point on this, thanks for your comments on that. Sheffield City Council did today say they're calling a temporary, but only a brief temporary hold to this tree replacement program because... 
they, they, they are acknowledging the depth and the breadth of the protests. They're acknowledging that they need to look into whether healthy trees are being felled or not. But, but the people who've put themselves in harm's way and who've been arrested, people I believe are genuine heroes for standing up to it. Many of them experts are adamant that these trees do not need to be felled. They're not diseased. They're in good, uh, uh, in good shape. John Rappaport is our guest. No more fake news dot com is uh, is John's uh, website. John, what what are we going to do about it? Because we see the reliance, not only our reliance now on technology, but we see how addicted to it our our, our young, you know, community members, our, our children are to this stuff. They can't get enough of it, John. They can't get enough of the phones and the tablets and the virtual reality headsets. I remember you speaking to me on this programme some years ago about virtual reality headsets and what they would do to the minds of people who use them, taking them two steps back from what reality is, um, what it would do to their brains. Re- you know, if we're rewiring the brains of our young, as I think we are and as you've been writing about, is there anything we can do to stop this coming down the line, John? Well, certainly by getting the information out as you're doing and I'm doing and other people are doing, that tips people off who are already awake but may not be informed, which is the first line uh, of approach here. Now, to try to uh, turn the oil tanker around, so to speak, that's a monumental job. In other words, to say, well, we're going to convince 5 billion people tomorrow that this is a really bad idea, this onrush of technology. But I think we're at the point where the people who are alert and awake, they need to be informed because they still do have some choices. For example, at least in the U.S., and I believe in some other countries as well, the homeschooling movement is taking off and expanding very, very quickly because parents are realizing that once education is out of their hands, that there is no way that they can pull their kids back from the onrush of this technology. It's just not going to happen. It's only through parents really being parents in a much older way that there's any chance of raising children who are free and independent of this web of uh, electronics that controls their brains and, uh, you know, brainwashes them into thinking that technology is everything. So they are the first line, certainly in my approach. And I urge people anywhere, parents who live in places where it is permitted to take up the sword, so to speak, of homeschooling and say, look, it may not be comfortable. It may not be the way we would like it. We would like to be able to say, here's a school, let the kids learn what they learn. But in the long run, that's not a good idea you've got to be the educator as well as the parent. And I don't mean just education and information, but education in in real values, not fake values, to raise your children so that they're strong and they have active minds that haven't been messed with to the degree that most other kids are experiencing these days. So that's where I would start anyway, Richie. It's really important you said that because... Researchers in South Korea, incredibly Korea, because obviously Samsung comes from Korea, but researchers in Korea last year did produce research, and I know you covered this story because I read no more fake news.com all the time, but researchers in Korea showed that it does have a very um, profound effect on the minds, on the brains of children when they use these devices. But they also showed that children being children Um, Because of the way children think, that unique, special, kind of open way that children are, that it's easier to wean them off it than it would be, you know, somebody in their late teens or 20s. They talked about nomophobia, which is this fear that adults have of not being able to check their phone. And you you talked to me before, John, about this kick, this um, almost this drug 
that is, you know, checking your phone when you hear it ping to see what sort of a message you have or what sort of a, a response you have to your Facebook post or whatever. But apparently it's 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 not so difficult to wean children off it and get children back to the, the you know, the ways of old, being outdoors, running around with their friends, playing sports or, you know, climbing in the treehouse or whatever. And, you know, nobody, I've never known anybody who's done as much research in health as a journalist as you. Is there evidence to support that, John, that, you know, ch- children are far more easy to reach and, 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 and get them away from this than maybe older people? I think that's self-evident. Yeah. Because with kids, you give them something else. It's not, I'm taking this away from yeah. you period you send a kid outside to play with his friends in some kind of an open space and you let this happen help this happen for a month and these kids are going to forget all about their devices because they're going to be having so much more excitement and fun and so on outside playing and when they come back in it's not going to be, I've got to get to my, you know, phone, my devices, my Facebook, my this, my that. You can wean them off of it if you give them what they really want at an early enough age, which is the freedom to play. That is far superior and always will be to these electronic devices. A cautionary note that I noticed when I lived in Southern California, I don't know how prevalent this is in other places, but I used to drive around Encinitas, which is a coast town uh, just north of San Diego, school playgrounds, school soccer fields, school baseball fields, et cetera, et cetera, on the weekends when there was no school. And most of them were completely empty. Nobody there. And I, I, at first I couldn't believe this because when I was a kid, we would always go to the school field on the weekends and we would play. We would, you know, just play. So I wondered why this was. And I sort of traced it down to insurance companies and their threats. In other words, now if an accident occurs on an unsupervised field that belongs to somebody like a school, then all of a sudden the lawyers close in with the lawsuits, et cetera, et cetera. And the insurance companies in the end have to pay if the judgment goes against them. So they can write in uh, clauses in their insurance policies with schools and churches and other institutions that have these open spaces and say, you've got to lock them up when they're unsupervised. That's got to change. Schools and other institutions have to rebel against that and say, no, 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 no. Our fields are open to children when they want to play, when school is not in session. People have to get back to the values. I mean, in in my day, uh, and I was hurt a couple of times, uh, you know, playing out there. Oh, well, that's just the way it is. These things can happen. It wasn't some draconian thing that occurred. Sometimes kids get hurt. And then they have to heal. Yeah, this happens, but nobody is suddenly liable. It's just part of growing up. That's the way it is. And this has to come back so that you have open spaces where you can put these kids and then they come back and then they look at their phone or whatever other device they have and they think, gee, that's nothing compared to being outside and playing. You've opened a can of worms there. I remember when I went to my high school, we, we call it secondary school, and I think it was two years in, and a lawsuit as it went against the school meant that for the rest of my time there, for the next four years I was in that high school, the after-school activities were just suspended, John. That's a great point there, and it is a massive can of worms. Just before we go, I wanted to ask you this uh, before... And this has got nothing to do now with your seniority and your experience and your age. Where do you get the energy, John? Because I read at least three times a week, I have a look at the articles on No More Fake News and I read them. And uh, I look into the the, the topics and, and um, you know, I, I take great inspiration out of them. You and one or two other websites, it must be said. But it's some it's two, sometimes three 
articles a day. But it's not just the stream of consciousness. It's brilliantly researched stuff, which takes a lot of time. I'm a journalist like yourself, so I know. Where do you get the energy and the motivation to keep doing it? Well, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you start? Uh, I would say quite some years ago, I made a decision that I was not going to do the traditional growing old, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, it was just a decision because I've seen like, you know, everybody has many old people. Uh, and what I'm talking about is people who just give up and give in and say, well, that's, I've had my day, it's over, et cetera, et cetera. So because I've always been, I would say maybe from the age of uh, 16 or so, a contrarian, you know, I just went against the grain. I decided I'm not going to go that way. I'm going to increase the amount of work that I do and deepen the commitment. And lo and behold, when I made that decision, I found that I had a great deal more energy. It just showed up. It was kind of like, well, this is a sort of a magic key here. If I commit myself to actually doing more of what I really want to do, then the energy shows up to do it. Isn't that interesting? And if I do less, then I have less energy. Well, that's kind of a revelation, and it was, and it's continued to prove itself out over the the years. It still works that way. Uh, you know, like in the last few days, I found some new, very extremely important subjects to write about, namely 5G and a new article I just posted on CRISPR, this gene editing breakthrough, so so to say, uh, okay, I'm on fire. I've got a lot of energy. Here we go. Let's go. Let's push it hard. Let's see how far we can get it out there. So I would say that's the short answer. The quality of the work, though, is what staggers me, you see. You know, but, but then, then you're a real writer. That's the thing. It's remarkable that you said that because we are living in a time where younger folks are being encouraged to think that you know, older people are finished and they're not worthwhile. And this is a system, <laughs> it's true, you know this, this is a system yes. thing. Demonise the elderly, blame them for all the ills of society today, blame them for the fact you don't have a house, blame them for the fact you don't have a job, blame them for the Brexit vote, blame them for Trump, blame them for everything. This is real, it's sinister and it's sickening and it goes against human history because forever and ever and ever and ever, We've well, we, maybe we don't so much anymore, but we used to value our 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 grandparents, our senior relatives who had experienced life, who knew stuff because they'd lived it. But what we're seeing today is we're seeing an attack on experience and an attack on wisdom and an attack on um, older people, elders. Um, I'll give you the final word on that, John. Do you see that? Do you are, are you bearing witness to that yourself, being um, a slightly senior man? Go ahead. <laughs> well, I'll be 80 in a couple of months, yeah. so I guess that qualifies. Uh, actually, I haven't experienced that personally. Uh, I've seen other people that I know kind of look at me uh, with a sort of a look like, well, he's he's getting older. And so I have to consciously push that away because if I buy that, then I have a really great patented excuse for just kind of winding down and doing less. So my strategy is to do more. Again, that's my strategy. Do more. If you feel uh, kind of fatigued and fuzzy, uh, you can always trace it to the fact that you're doing less. Okay, that's the clue. So do more. Then I do more and then I feel like, okay, everything's all right again, you know. Uh, and I'm just going to keep going. Yeah, I'm just going to, finally on that, I'm going to say, I, 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 this is genuine admiration. It's not anything else. You know, when, I, I sometimes get a bit bogged down with making live radio shows daily. And um, I do honestly, I'm not just saying this, I do think Rappaport is banging out three very well-written articles a day and he's approaching <laughs> 80. You have no excuse 
Alan. <laughs> just get on. Just get on with it and don't complain. You know, we could talk to you all night. And if you go on to Twitter, um, anybody wants to go on to Twitter now and put Richie Allen Show, all one word in Twitter. We've had hundreds of tweets since John has been on. Uh, from people who read his articles there. Uh, William Henderson listening in Scotland saying he could listen to John Rappaport all day. Well, I could too. Go to nomorefakenews.com. Thanks for your time, my friend. Thanks for all that work. Those are excellent articles, as always. But this week on 5G and the Internet of Things, share them all over the Internet, folks. Share them with people. Print them out and give them to people and uh, make them read them. John, thanks again, mate. I look forward to speaking to you again in the future. I salute you, Richie, and your program. It's always great to be uh, on with you, and uh, we'll talk soon again. Can't wait. Thanks, John. The brilliant John Rappaport. Folks, go to nomorefakenews.com. If you haven't put that website, bookmark it, and get it on your your your, your, um, your bar, the, the bar at the top of your uh, homepage, and check him out, because on a daily basis, th- this is, this is a, a man who years, for years, wrote for some of the biggest publications in America, the big dailies, the big tabloids on health issues and other matters. He's an absolutely meticulous journalist and it's great to have him writing these articles at a time when these issues are critical, when you have 17,500 trees being cut down because apparently the 5G frequency doesn't pass well through trees. You have healthy trees being cut down. You have people being arrested for protesting it. And, um, and and nobody's any the wiser to this because, you know, 5G and the possible effects of 5G, harmful or otherwise, are not being discussed on BBC Channel 4 or ITV today. That's a fact. 